Welcome to the Bonnie Podcast, the podcast making England vulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. I'm your host, Shane Rayo, too, coming to you from the Pre-Plug of Pasadena, the Silverator's Paradise. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about this burgeoning parallel network, just visit PazniaPazenia.com and uh, consider becoming a stakeholder. Uh, today, I'm pleased to be joined by the host of the most thermodynamically sound podcast in existence, uh, Richard Dick Greaser and Rod Palmer from the Bitcoin Bugle. Uh, Bitcoin Bugle. They are credentialed journalists in that they have bachelor's degrees in journalism, uh, credentialed Bitcoiners, in the sense that not only do they always get in their 40 hours of Bitcoin podcasts a week, uh, probably uh, a lot more than that, uh, they host a weekly Bitcoin podcast, uh, the Bugle Weekly. And uh, they're also both credentialed, extremely talented musicians. Uh, you can find all of Richard's music uh, at LibertarianAttack.com, on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you tune into music. Uh, Rod's music, I believe, is on uh, Wave Lake, uh, but he can fill us in on that uh, momentarily. And uh, as I mentioned a number of times, hopefully in the near future, Richard can come perform at Bonnie Fest too. Uh, that would be a, uh, a true honor. Uh, anyway, I'll leave the uh, rest of the introductions to the guests. Uh, Richard, a.k.a. Dick, and Rod, uh, welcome to the Bonnie Podcast. Uh, how are we doing tonight, gentlemen? Oh, doing, doing, doing fantastic. Yeah, doing great. Uh, thanks for having us on. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Take two, and I th every thanks looks to be working, working nicely. So, um, right on. Yeah, it's it's awesome to be, to be uh, joined by you and to overcome technical difficulties, which um, seems to just be a common theme now. Um, but uh, regardless, uh, yeah, it's great great to be joined by you guys. Um, let's go start with some some introductions, uh, if if we could. Um, and Rod, I suppose you can start. Uh, I guess uh, give us a little background on uh, who you are, uh, what you do, and uh, where people can find uh, your music and, and all that good stuff. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's the, the technical difficulties. Know all about those. People think that uh, it's just so easy. All you need is a laptop and a camera to be a Bitcoin podcaster. But it's a lot more technically complex than uh, than people realize. It's just something that's important to know. But yeah, I'm a journalist at the Beagle, and uh, we got music on Wave Lake, um, which is where you can stream sats uh, to listen to music, and you can zap the music that you like. Uh, you can find me on social media and uh yeah happy to be here awesome take it away richard yeah um I, my thought on technical difficulties is is you know i've been trying to you know work these technology things for a while and struggling with it and so i just outsourced it to a super hot blonde named kaylee and like we haven't had any issues on our podcast but if you go back and you listen before kaylee there was a serious jump in quality so that's what i would say look out for is a super hot spoken blonde um i put a i put out a job posting for it but we just kind of like organically found her in nashville and she yeah, it like was, it was serendipitous yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess Rod, yeah. Ron and I were mm -hmm. walking up and down Broadway, and I was looking for Haley Welch, and I was asking every blonde woman that I could see if they were Haley Welch, and you know we just kind of stumbled into Kaylee Welch, you know. Yeah, she was, he was asking everybody, are, ask everybody, are you the the hawk to a girl? Every single person, even even you know brunettes. Well, there were there were like men running around with t-shirts that said hawk two on it right and so i mean it you never like know finding, these days. it was like finding a needle in a haystack is what we did yeah you never know these days because like i feel like some of the dudes got offended because they thought i was trying to misgender them <laughs> you know it's actually okay to misgender people now i think that's the big lesson for this selection this week well, but, it's legal in De it's legal in Tennessee as well, of course. That's why Nashville. Yeah. That's why the conference was there. Well, that's what this selection was a referendum on was you know people's rights to misgender mm -hmm. each other, and the American people chose that misgendering is cool. I suppose so. Yeah, I suppose yeah. so. <laughs> so. Sorry for the tangent. Um, oh, that's all. Good. I am a credential journalist. I, I founded the, uh, the Bugle. Um, I just, this week, I stepped into politics for the first time as a journalist. I uh, actually gave a formal endorsement to a candidate, which is very unusual for me. Oh, wow. Um, but I, I like to think that I, I had an impact on this selection, that I moved the needle a little bit. I, I did endorse Chase Oliver. I did not vote for him, but I endorsed him. And I felt like I did my civic duty. 
uh, to America and um, the American people. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. Well, thank you for your service, um, of course. Um, but, uh, yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, Philippe Bill and a little, uh, so yeah, you, you, uh, mentioned you found the Bugle, you mentioned, uh, Kaylee, I guess, yeah, tell us a little bit more, um, cause that was, you know, it's such a great story. Um, I heard you mention, uh, you know, retell it all on your podcast. You guys, uh, you know, uh, you know, go, you ro- drove around, uh, Nashville in our Jeep for a little bit, I guess. Yeah. Give, give us all the, all the gritty details. Yeah. I mean, I, th- I think like. I, I think the reason why people really struggle to hire the talent that they want in, uh, you know, news agencies, podcast agencies is because there's been this hyper focus on political correctness. Um, you know, everybody thinks like HR is watching them. Right. And so one of the keys that we d- used in hiring, um, our producer, Kaylee is we put a job posting out explicitly saying we wanted a attractive blonde former sorority girl that drove a white cheap Wrangler. And we put a lot of emphasis on the fact that she had to be hot. And I think that just kind of put the energy into the universe, you know, of being able to, to actually find what many would consider a unicorn. Right. You just got to put out the energy that you want to receive back. And that's how you will find your podcast producer. Yeah. And I, I think most people, they just set the bar too low for themselves. You know, they're like, okay, if I'm going to hire a female podcast producer, she's going to be a mid, you know, because they're more affordable. And like, sometimes you just have to spend money, you know, to make money. And this right. is definitely it's... one of those circumstances. And you have to look on the bright side because, you know, this type of search you're already starting with, uh, you know, only having to pay 70% of the true value. So it's like a bargain on the right from the get-go. Yeah. And I, I think part of the reason why it's important, you know, of like not settling is because like, it, it's hard to find women like this that are based, you know what I mean? In this day and age. It's, it's hard to find women that think that smoking's cool and that driving drunk is good. It, it's hard to find women in general that are even capable of effectively driving drunk. Yeah, right. Like people that can have the skill of drinking and driving adversarially. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's you know, all uh, all incredible, uh, incredible uh you know, stuff, I guess, uh, let's, let's get a little, a little more into this. Uh, cause you know, I mentioned in the introduction and yeah, people haven't listened to the beagle. They might be a little, a little lost, but, uh, um, so yeah, I guess let's, let's, yeah. Talk about the, uh, I guess the, the goals of the Bitcoin beagle, what you guys, I guess your overarching thing that you do. And then I guess, uh, if you could talk a little bit about, um, the intellectual silk road, which is, uh, an even bigger vision, but yeah, I guess, tell us, I guess, get, get us a little deeper into the bugle. Well, yeah. So I, I, the, the beagle, I, I consider myself the John Galt of journalism, and I, I'm pretty confident that your audience knows who John Galt is. They're probably, mm-hmm. you know, living life in a way that is pretty based. They, they're probably listening to Bitcoin podcasts on occasion or, or frequently and reading Atlas Shrugged once a year. But I think of the Bugle essentially as the the Galt's Gulch of journalism. And like, we really need, needed something like that. There was a, there was a market that was created for something like the Bugle, you know, by all the people that, you know, Rand would have described as looters. And what's the word that you turn to use? Servile society. Mm-hmm. Or um, or the first what, what do you refer to as the looters? There's a different one. Uh, the looters. Well, um, there's a different word. Yeah. <clears throat> well, there's bludgies. Um, I want to use the Pasnian. Oh, yeah, mm-hmm. bludgies. Yeah. Bludgies, probably bludgies. So you know, most mo- most journalists out there living on a fiat standard. They're employed by the CIA. They haven't listened to Bitcoin podcasts. They don't think Lynn Alden's hot. And if you don't know who Lynn Alden is, she is smoking hot. She's a Bitcoin macro commentator. 
Yeah, like she, Lynn Alden is this hot babe who knows about stocks and knows about uh, GameStop and knows about bonds and Bitcoin and gold and like she knows how which ones to buy. Uh, she's just if you're if you like to trade crypto or fucking you know gold or or stocks, mean stocks. Lynn Alden is a hot babe and knows about that. She's got a great YouTube channel. But anyways, yeah, Richard. But yeah, so so the world needed something like the Bugle to, to come out there to tell people the truth about a lot of topics that, you know, the rest of the media is unwilling to tell the truth on. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of people out there that are doing podcasts, but the problem with what they're doing is most of them are not credentialed. And so we've decided to marry the two. We've married kind of this new form of media with credentials. And um, I think it's a pretty powerful force that has resulted. Um, but like the core tenants essentially are, you know, using Bitcoin as money. We support non-KYC commerce. Um, we support smoking cigarettes because anybody that says that cigarettes are bad for you are probably employed by some sort of communist regime. Yeah, um, and to introduce myself, I just want to piggyback on what Richard is talking about here because, yeah, my name's Rod Palmer. Uh, I, I came to the Bugle, you know, several months, maybe a year or so after Richard had started it. Richard had left his previous career as a mainstream journalist. Uh, he became an alcoholic. He ruined his life, so that's a, he had a rebirth in this new, this new project, the Bugle. And then I started seeing is journalism and i was like wow like that is the type of journalism uh, that i want to see in my in my industry you know in my country uh because i think that there's it's just so lacking like you, one of the things you talked about like the servile class it relies so much on you know or you all of society in general but relies on on, on journalists like we we watch tv we read the newspaper and we they tell us how to think. They tell us what's going on in the news. They tell us what's going on in the economy. They tell us what's going on in Israel and Ukraine. And, and that is what they say is gospel. It is the truth. And like, that is what we rely on to make our decisions. And it started to, they started to lose our trust. And people have started to migrate to podcasts, especially Bitcoin podcasts. So now people are listening, especially if they are listening to 40 hours per week, which they should be. A Bitcoin podcast, that is where they're getting their information. They're, they're reading the bugle or the, and, you know, they're following the bugle that we are giving them that information about the truth that is happening in their world, in their industry. And that is, that is, you know, that's what they believe. They don't want to do the thinking. They let us do the thinking for them. And so, but to, because podcasts are, are just greatly growing and having so much impact and consequence on people's thinking. It's in, in credentials are important. Lack of credentials ruin, ruin the mainstream media and credentials will fix Bitcoin podcasting. So you need to have somebody who listens to at least 40 hours of Bitcoin podcasts every week and who follows Bitcoin Twitter and who knows all the best sailor memes and knows all the best, uh, you know, all the best stuff about Ben Alden's videos. Like that is who you need to to be your bitcoin podcast or to deliver that news that journalism otherwise it's you know it could be it's it's a larp it's it's just advertising it's not real news very yeah. well put yeah well said well said so i want to get to the intellectual silk road but um since mm -hmm. i guess you, you brought up the question kind of the importance um a, a question that comes to mind is um, that I would love to get your guys' thoughts on. Um, are there enough Bitcoin podcasts currently? Because I, I know, um, like, in libertarian circles, it's like, oh, another libertarian podcast. Like, there's, there's, you know, like, it seems like the market's oversaturated. Um, what do you, how do you think that, I guess, the market for Bitcoin podcasts is? Are there, are there enough now? Do we need more? What do you think? I think that I think we need more and I think there's going to be a million, million more. And I think the problem would be if you're thinking about why should I start my own? What do I have to talk about? How can I be better than, you know, what Bitcoin did or uh, Reddit will recap or the Bugle 
or ungovernable misfits or rock, paper, Bitcoin. How can I be better than them? I'm just brand new, but it's, don't think about it that way. It's, it's like this fractal of all these different communities, whether you're super into libertarianism or anarchy or cooking or being a, a you know, somebody who lives off the land, a, a homesteader, you want to grow pot, you want to work in the tech world. You, there's all these little different communities. You get a Bitcoin podcast about that specific uh, niche. Your interest is what you're interested in. It's what you care about. And the people who also care about those things will find you. And then you can create your own intellectual silk road, which we can get into later. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, we definitely need more Bitcoin podcasts, but I think we also need a lot more libertarian podcasts. And it's pretty obvious that libertarian podcasts are pushing the envelope because the libertarian superhero Ron Paul is going to be a part of the the Trump administration, and I would say that that's only the re a result of podcasts. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. But Larkin Rose is still having to post booty pics of his wife on his YouTube thumbnails. To get any sort of engagement which kind of shows that there's still a lot of room to be done in the libertarian park podcasting world that's a valid point yeah valid point okay yeah well that that's great so yeah you mentioned it once um intellectual silk road um where does the bugle tie into that and where do uh you know other uh you know i guess uh, other um alliances fit into uh, the intellectual silk road i will richard Lang, you answer that how uh, you, you know because i think it's a little bit different to everybody they the intellectual silk road is a decentralized organization if you want to call it an organization or a group chat or a federation of group chats or a minister real i don't know but richard what do you think how, how would you describe it well i would describe the intellectual silk road as a cabal and i think this is something like, you know, people need to understand is there's, you know, all, all these individuals out there forming, you know, their, their cabals to try and, um, come up with new creative ways to steal our shit and, you know, monitor us, and, you know, limit people's rights to smoke cigarettes, you know, all, all sorts of outrageous things. Outrageous. Um, and, and, you know, there, there's this you know, kind of organization, there's this organization called PodConf and PodConf is this shadowy group that has successfully controlled most of the narratives around Bitcoin. And so they control the conferences. So, so PodConf is short for the podcast conference industrial complex. Um, which I think is pretty self-explanatory if you're in and around, you know, the Bitcoin ecosystem a little bit and, you know, influencer culture, you can, you can probably understand what PodConf is. Um, but yeah, PodConf is, you know, doing a lot of things that we thought were pretty unhelpful. So this is part of the reason why we started the podcast in the first place. Um, but as we started podcasting, we started building relationships with all these other you know, individuals out there, such as you, um, our good friend Fundamentals, you know, and, and a lot of people that exist and operate in this value for value economy. Um, and that's where the intellectual Silk Road was, was formed is, you know, we, as we started to connect with people that we liked and shared our values more so than PodConf, um, we figured out that we could essentially, you know, I, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about what we do, but we, we can essentially form a cabal to, to put up a, you know, pretty significant stand against PodConf and defeat it. But like one of the problems with PodConf is, you know, it's an ecosystem essentially created to sell people products. Um, they don't care about reporting the news. All they care about is number go up. They don't care about privacy. They don't care about freedom. They don't care about, you know, allowing people to think for themselves. You know, they more so want to just like publish clickbait out there and, 
you know, promote KYC for the city and compliance in general. Um, it's just very unattractive, I think, to the average person that has a brain. Um, which is, you know, why the intellectual Silk Road is so important. It is. Yeah. It's a very yeah. powerful cabal that will do scary things like promote freedom in powerful ways. Yeah, um, and I think that that's a great description. And I, and I would say I would try to frame it or explain it as from the perspective that it's so easy to connect with people, to connect with brands, to connect with other podcasters online, whether it's social media, Telegram, Signal, whatever, your own website, your own forum, however. But with that just ease of connecting with people and sharing information with people, it, it's, it gets very difficult to know who's a Fed and who's not a Fed. And I think that creating these secret societies, these cabals, uh, there really, there's no one way admission. There's no single way. There's no like I sign up with my email or my end pub and I'm in the intellectual self road. It, like, it doesn't work that way. You can be in this intellectual self road, but there's really no proof that you're there and you can work with those people and you can cooperate with those people all over the world and you can exchange value for value. Uh, by liking each other's Bitcoin podcasts online and liking and boosting their journalism and, and, and boosting money to their songs on Wavelake. And um, it's, and you can do that and you can filter for all the feds and spooks who might be trying to fuck with you um, off like Twitter, for example. Yeah, basically creating a, creating yeah, a, like own, the boosting own 33rd part degree is really of Freemasonry. Because. <laughs> Right, like a, a, it's like a, it's like a secret society, like the skull and bones, and it is Fed resistant. It's like a, like you have censorship resistant, Fed resistant, spook resistant. Yeah. It's just creating resistance to the state. Certainly, certainly. Go ahead, Richard. Sorry to jump in there. Well, the the boosting side of it is very important because there's we don't we don't have the luxury of having our agents embedded inside of, um, you know, these social media platforms to give us artificial engagement, uh, like these intelligence agencies do. And so we, we either have to get it organically or, you know, boost each other. And so that's like a big part of the network too, is like groups of individuals that are like-minded trying to do things differently. Like, I can guarantee, like, one of the requirements of being in the intellectual silk robe is that you, you're not allowed to go to any ditty parties yes. whatsoever. Yeah. So, like, if you've been having, if you've been having sex with underage children and somebody has it on video and is using it to extort you, you're not allowed in, in the intellectual silk robe. Right, right. Sharing, yeah. Being into weird shit like that, like child porn, is the number one way to to end up interacting with a Fed. It's it's always the Feds. If anybody thinks that way, that's a Fed. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I would, I would, I would. Uh, yeah, I'd have to agree. I would have to agree. Um, so so I guess um a question uh. Gosh, I, a question comes to mind. We're talking about PodConf. Um, again, I, like I, I, I know some, I know some about it, but I, I guess I, I'm not sure about uh, about one individual in, in, in particular. Um, and uh, it's funny. I, I, was, I mentioned to you, Richard, that uh, you know, I guess I, I hadn't, I hadn't started my 40 hours of Bitcoin podcast a week, so I guess maybe I just didn't know um, who uh, Dennis Porter was. But you talked about him a lot. He seems pretty important. Um, and I know those might be fighting words. You know, like the, these might be fighting words. Um, but uh, you know who is Dennis Porter? Um, is he a part of PodConf? Uh, is he you know a good guy? Fill us in on on uh, on Dennis Porter. Yeah, I would say Dennis Porter is kind of like the chief superhero of statism when it comes to um, when it comes to Bitcoin. He he 
is very he's a very powerful figure in the general political ecosystem um he's a deal maker essentially um so i would kind of consider him like the the henry kissinger of bitcoin of his time um and he you know is fighting for our rights to to use bitcoin and without him you know bitcoin probably would have been banned and we wouldn't be allowed to use it um so he he's essentially fighting to ensure that we're we're able to be compliant um and, and it's a very noble cause and so uh right. I, and the the thing about Dennis Porter, he's so effective. He's so charming. He's such a he's such a slick politician. He's a good looking guy. He's got confidence. He's tall. He is like a young Donald Trump. And his his, his what he's selling is Bitcoin. And he's doing it really well. He's orange pilling all the politicians. He's he, and everybody I think everybody who's listening to this knows um the the impact the consequence of trying to orange pill politicians and fighting for your right to have, you know, Bitcoin written in some government law is, you know, the, the amount of damage that you can do is equivalent to the amount of, uh, to the amount of value you can add. So I think it, like, if you think about how, how much value it adds to, to have a, a, a government, a state government, say you have the right to, to own Bitcoin however much value you think that adds any negative that Dennis Porter, any harm that Dennis Porter could do has that same amount of impact. So as he's, it's, you know, it's, you kind of just have to look at Dennis Porter and think the guy is, you think of like so thermodynamically efficient that like a system's like a well-oiled machine, but he's like, so, um, thermodynamically efficient and being like having no impact yet all the impact in the world at the same time it's in, it's incredible yeah he, he's the type of guy that you probably want you don't want your wife hanging around with one-on-one -on -one. right you know what i mean right gotcha and he was uh he, he's been uh, orange pilling trump right um i guess uh recently but then the not trump started his own shit coin though um no 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 david bailey from bitcoin magazine is the one who oh. has been orange pilling Trump. Dennis Porter has been orange pilling everybody else, but the, but the, but David Bailey, the the owner of Bitcoin Magazine, he's really the one who's been or orange pilling Trump, which explains why Trump has become a shit coiner. Because David Bailey, even though he owns Bitcoin Magazine, Some he's part. a shit coiner. He's a degenerate shit coiner. If Dennis Porter was the one that was orange pilling Donald Trump, there would be no shit coin scams. But unfortunately, that is not how it broke down. Wow. Okay. All right. Anything else on uh, Dennis Porter? Because I got one other. There's one other person we mentioned. Uh, you guys mentioned in passing. Um, I guess kind of the uh, um, some of the people you um, you hold in high regard. But anything else on Dennis Porter before I uh, jump us forward? Well, well, we could we could probably do a five or six hour podcast. I mean, that would just be barely scratching the surface on Dennis Porter. So maybe we'll save Dennis Porter facts and stories for the next time. Because we, we, we should do. Forever. We should definitely do a series called What's Dennis Porter? I think it's a great idea. Yeah. I think that would probably rival the the Michael Saylor, Robert Breedlove, What is Money series. And, uh, yeah, yeah. The Saylor series. Yeah. Okay, very good. Um, yeah, I think that's all we got on Dennis. I mean, Dennis is incredible. Like, he, he, he does have the power... He has the power to cure erectile dysfunction. Like, that's how powerful he is. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've heard you guys talk about that on the podcast. I wasn't I wasn't aware of those superpowers, I guess. Um, but, uh, yeah, so jumping forward to the, uh, again, someone else you guys hold in high regard, Lynn Alden. Um, and now I have to say, I've, I've listened to, I started listening to one podcast uh, that she was on. And, um... I didn't think she talked for like the first half hour because um, I thought I was listening to the, 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 the you know the male guest talking, only to find out she was like the only one that was talking the whole time. Um, she's basically the sole participant in the conversation. So I guess that observation aside, um, what are the Beagle's views on Lynn Alden? Um, does she actually have two ears? Um, 
I guess yeah. I guess yeah. Tell us tell us about Lynn Alden. Kind of the most important things about her. Well, I think the most important thing about her is she's hot. I don't know why this is a controversial subject in the little ecosystem that we're in, but you know, lots of people like to dispute the fact that Lynn is hot, hot. and right. I, I think it just can be explained as they're homosexuals who don't find right. attractive right. women attractive. Think, think about it like this. If you were hanging out with your buddy and his wife said that she wanted to set you up with her friend, Katie, and um, you asked like, well, tell me about Katie. And she's like, well, she's really funny. She has a good job. Um, you know, she she's really down to earth, has a good sense of humor. I'm going to start to think, oh, shit, Katie is fat and ugly. But then I might still go through with it and then I meet her. And like, and she's hot. I'm like, oh my God, like next time I ask you that question, just tell me the important information. It's, is your friend hot or not? Right. So it's like, if you want me to tell you about Lynn Alden, I'm going to tell you is she's hot and you can find out the rest of her personality later, if that's what interests you, but like, she's hot. Yeah. That's a, that's a very good description. But all right. I, mean, I think part of the reason why a lot of people don't find her hot or claim to not find her hot is because they don't, they're like, they just have weak um, and fragile egos. And there's something so intimidating to them about a woman that knows way more about macro and Bitcoin than them. Because, like, the, the thing to understand about Lynn, Lynn Alden, so like, you know, to understand Bitcoin even remotely, you have to listen to 40 hours of Bitcoin podcasts every week uh, and just continuously expand your knowledge over a period of, you know, years and maybe even decades. Um, Lynn is on 40 hours of podcasts a week. She is a walking Bitcoin podcast. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and you, you alluded to the question about Lynn Alden's about Lynn Alden's ears. How many ears does she have? Well, it's 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 almost like mythology, but when you've listened to enough hours of Bitcoin podcast, when you've listened to enough Bitcoin podcast, you will see both of Lynn Alden's ears. But until you've seen both of Lynn Alden's ears, you have not listened to enough hours. A Bitcoin podcast. Hmm. It's a good barometer. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. Definitely think so. <clears throat> All right. Well, I appreciate uh, appreciate those insights. Um, I guess we've been going for about a half hour here, and I want to uh, pause for a moment um, for a music break. Um, so I think you know why uh, why not? Um, but uh, so I suppose we will do uh, um, one of yours, Richard. Um, I guess, uh, um, either, let me see, uh, I mean, you mentioned Ayn Rand earlier, you want to, uh, um, take a break for Ayn Rand, so smoking is good for you, potentially, would be a good idea?
So after that, uh, that short music break, um, I guess uh, um, you know, let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, what transpired yesterday. Um, I guess uh, the, uh, the selection uh, that just uh, transpired, we talked a little bit about it, but um, I wanted to bring people's uh, attention to your last podcast. Um, you guys had a couple election specials. And um, yeah, there were a couple really, you know, really valuable insights um, gained from it. Uh, and the first one, I've been harping, I've been, you know, you know, I guess every single year I put out a, a few posts at this time, um, basically reminding people that their vote for president, their vote for president election is irrelevant because they're selected by the electors. Um, but maybe I haven't been correct about that. You made you made a stellar point that maybe it's not the electors that you have to get to, but um, or inf- that you have to influence. Um, no, the people you have to convince are those who are friends with Diddy and Epstein. Epstein. So um, that was a pretty, um, you know, pretty huge connection. Um, there for me. Yeah, it's it's kind of like when you look at history, ancient history, and then, you know, who knows how much of ancient history is uh, literally true uh, or it's just what survived. And it's it's kind of the 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 moral of the story made it through thousands of years in these different story in these historian takes. Right. But you look at like when Syria took over what is now like that Syria and they, and they we said you can you pay taxes as long as you, you don't upset uh, their, the you can vote but the electors are only going to select and the electors themselves are only going to be in the position to be electors to select the people who uh, are friends with Diddy and Epstein who, who they approve of. And if, as long as you've got some, oh, for some idiot dipshit who is, you know, he's going to be like, I'm the mood. I'm going to cast my vote for democracy. As long as you got somebody like that, like you can, you can just let them run with it. But if somebody gets in there, who's like actually threatening the, the upper class or the elite class in any way or the power structure in any way, and they will, um, they will get arrested or they will get disappeared or they'll be made the enemy of the state if they try to, you know, continue their political ambitions. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. It's a, I mean, it's the only way if you, if you actually want to create change, you have to either go to Diddy parties or support or slash pay somebody to go for you to represent right. whatever you want done. Like that's that's the way that lobbying is really done. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And I appreciate you guys for pointing that out because again, I've been uh, you know on it, you know, on this for you know almost a decade, um, pointing this out. But you know, maybe I was wrong um, all this time. So you know, it's good to be proven wrong, um, especially on important matters uh, such as these. But um, I guess any other takeaways? Uh, um, I know we talked a little bit about. Uh, um, I guess uh, um, orange pilling Trump, um, David Bailey, um, doing that and kind of failing. But uh, what are some other takeaways from from this selection? Is it good for Bitcoin? Is the economy fine for another four years? Yeah. Um, what do you think? The, yeah, the, the the economy is fine. It's never been better, actually. I think Bitcoin is at all time highs today. So yeah, the economy's fine. Bitcoin's fine. Uh, the Middle East is fine. 
But I think the takeaway is that, um, I mean, the only takeaway that I can think of uh, is that Democrats suck so much that America decided to give Hitler a second chance. Yeah, I mean, I think the big way takeaway from this selection is that democracy is officially over. And yeah. that's what the people voted for. They, they voted against democracy. They voted for um, Hitler. And uh, we have now branched into this new form of government, which people on the left call fascism and people on the right, I guess they call it populism. Um, but yeah, I mean, we America has a new daddy. Yeah, uh, we there's a really high turnout. In fact, a lot of libertarians uh, this year actually voted um, for the Republican or the Democrat, mostly for the Republican. But, you know, and even like some of the state parties endorsed uh, Donald Trump. And I think it was people finally realized that I can actually vote for, we can actually vote in whoever we want, no matter how crazy and retarded they are. Um, and some people just wanted to participate in that because it doesn't happen often. So this is, that's what he means. This is the end of democracy. So they're, they're probably never going to let, um, never let us, us do this again. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it's kind of interesting to think about what, what do these people mean by the end of democracy? And I think, you know, what they, what they mean is their view of democracy, you know, it's kind of like the boomers that have propagated this idea. They have this idea of civility and decor, right? Those are like, some people's favorite words other people just want to you know celebrate that puerto rico is a pile of trash and they don't care what the setting is um and there's kind of a split here where trump is a lot more based you know than than politicians that have ran before him which kind of changes the dichotomy of government you know the these individuals that you know are, are screaming and decrying you know what's going on in the end of our democracy you know they they believe that democracy is essentially facilitated by cia ran media sources like the new york times like the washington post you know and cnn and and, and all the others fox news um the ones that you know are constantly you know reassuring us about the fine state of the economy um but you know donald trump is the first bitcoiner of note to go on rogan you know recently since andreas Antonopoulos, right and he's the first bitcoin pleb to run as a politician and you know he supports rfk who doesn't like fluoride um and seems pretty based and he's inviting Ron Paul in. So he, he's presenting as more based than any politician before, you know, and, and he's actually relying on using, you know, his skill set to try and create like actual consent from the governed. Um, whereas the, the other, the other individuals were, you know, just essentially trying to replicate what they're doing before and, you know, if necessary, use force to enforce their politician or policies, regardless of the population's consent. Um, so that's a that's a pretty big shift. Um, I don't think they like how based he is. Hmm. <clears throat> Yeah, I guess uh, Kamala would have never gone on a Bitcoin podcast. I don't think Chase Oliver ever went on a Bitcoin podcast. Um, Joe Jorgensen did it in 2020. Um, I don't even think she knew what Bitcoin was. Um, yet, you know, Trump is, you know, hardcore orange pilled. And people see it as a as a big threat. Yeah. 
Yeah, and another thing comes to mind uh, that I guess you pointed out, and I, really, I guess I hadn't thought about it that much. I don't think about political crusading um, all that much uh, personally, but um, I, I think it's something that, that you mentioned, Richard, but um, you basically have uh, um, you know small government Republicans and even some libertarians happy that um, you know, big governments can take on the responsibility of, you know, getting rid of, uh, seed oils and, um, glyphosate and such. Um, you know, um, when, I mean, both of those, uh, you know, affiliations should know the inefficiencies of government and all. Um, so I think that's hilarious. That's, you know, that's a, that's a good point. Um, and, uh, you know, it just, it reminds me, it, it makes sense though for, it makes sense though for America. Cause that's how it was, I mean, the, the entire the reason for the shift from the Articles of Confederation to the Constitution was because there was no taxing authority, and uh, they had to pay down the the Revolutionary War debt somehow. Um, so they just socialized it. Um, they used socialism and not the free market. So um, I guess it's interesting. Um, you know, things really don't change that much. But um, just rambling aside. <laughs> Anything else on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I think that uh, yeah, it was. Just, I, I just think that uh, it would make Murray Rothbard so proud to know that the government's finally going to ban seed oils uh, and, and fix our food. I think he's. I think he'd be really proud of that. Right. Yeah. They're de definitely the best institution, but definitely the best organization to do it. Yeah. Certainly. Go ahead, Richard. I mean, it seems like something right out of Mises' playbook. Right. Yeah, that's true. I think that's what they 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 specialized in in the Mises uh, Mises Academy this summer. Maybe so. I mean, maybe. Well, yeah. I, mean, I don't know. Listen to too much. Walter yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of incredible. Yeah. I mean, I think that the average person, you know, they they kind of have an idea vaguely of what's good and bad for you. Like a lot of people have been misled by government education. They think that smoking's bad. It's almost universal, um, because people haven't really given the, been given the opportunity to you know explore for themselves what's real, uh, or they haven't taken the plunge, um, done the proof of work, and that's just a result of living in in the fiat world. Um, but things are changing. You know, Bitcoin has won. Um, and I think we're getting to the point where, you know, we, we just really need government to ban things because um, people haven't gotten to that point yet where they're actually ready to make decisions for themselves based on what they right. know to be true. Right. Um, I, I think I think we still live in a point in time where people need the government to ban things so that like they know what is good to do like if you weren't smart enough to do the research to know that um that COVID wasn't really that harmful it the government had to ban ivermectin so people would would go out and try to get this you know this simple medicine that you know is kind of anti-viral and can cure a few like weird skin rashes and they had to take that when they and so when they got COVID they didn't die um, and they wouldn't have died anyway, but you know, they took the ivermectin or they took some supplements and they, they just slowly learn like everything the government bans, but they ban something that really isn't that important. So, oh, this is a psyop. So they just need the government to ban stuff instead of being able to do the research themselves. They need to, the government to show them the things that they, they have to try. Mm -hmm. Interesting and, point. You know, it, it's okay now specifically with well the, it's okay when the trump administration does it because he's based but the you know the biden administration it's not cool because he's not based he doesn't right. say the things that we like he doesn't say good things about bitcoin um so i don't think he should have the ability to ban anything yeah right the, like the like biden just bans things that are good for his corrupt you know enterprises and that doesn't tell us anything like when trump bans it it's like oh that means it's a stupid thing to ban um so i should try it myself or somebody like biden it's like he's just dude being corrupt i i don't get any signal from this decision yeah 
But, um, I mean, I think one of the most base parts about Trump is he, uh, he is allegedly going to let Ross out of prison. And I think that's something people are pretty excited about. I think a lot of people that were hesitant to vote for him, um, because they had doubts about his intentions in all of this, you know, what pushed him over the edge is, uh, is Ross. Yeah. I think a lot of people are, were, I think we just learned that if you spend, if you give enough money to a politician and you sacrifice enough of your own personal reputation and credibility to send for that politician, you might be able to get one person out of jail and be worth it sometimes. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. That, so that, that's what, it's uh, a really tough position for him to be in, you know? Mm -hmm. So, he, you know, Ross had to sacrifice a lot. So we kind of sacrificed a little bit of our, of our, you know, ourselves a little bit simping for a politician to get him out because he deserved it. He deserves to get out. We had to do what we had to do. That's how I feel about it. You had to do what you had to do. It was a business deal. Yeah, well, I'm glad you. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. Trump. I've been uh, no, I, I definitely haven't I either. Did. But um, I, I, I guess my, I, I was asked about it at Bonnie Fest, and I was like, you know, I, I'm a single issue non-voter, and it's like if if Trump does that one good thing for that one person, like then he might actually like he might be a real human human being. So that's kind of where, I guess that's my barometer. If he actually upholds that, upholds that, and helps one person's family so much, um, yeah, we'll see. We will see. A lot can happen in what a couple months. Yeah, I just, I just, I just hope Ross listens to this to know that I did help get him out, and you guys did it. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I feel like my conscience is clean with uh, my endorsement. Oh yeah, of Chase Oliver. I, yeah. I feel like Chase Oliver would have. Yeah, he would have. He would have let Ross out for sure. Um, it, you know, it could be argued that, you know, my endorsement of Chase actually helped, um, get Ross out because Chase, I think, took more votes away from Kamala than he did from Trump. That's true. That's true. That's one of those things that, uh, you always have to consider. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. That's the game theory, you know? Yeah. Very good, guys. So we've been going for about yeah about fifty minutes here, uh, and I want to I want to take a little time to focus on uh, on the music, and then also um, a few minutes on Fountain, because um, uh, it'd be cool to get more people on Lightning, because um, I've been I've been using it um, successfully for uh, a number of months. Uh, I've been using Fountain and Zeus, so I want to let people know how they can you know get on Lightning and you know, start boosting. But um, I guess. Uh, um, I guess, yeah, we'll start. Uh, um, Richard, um, obviously we've got your music at uh, libertarianattack.com. Uh, people can get digital albums, but they're, uh, they're available everywhere, YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, uh, and then on Wave Lake too. But uh, I guess, yeah, tell us a little bit about uh, your, your forays into, into music and why, uh, um, how you have the time to be a credentialed journalist and a credentialed musician. Uh, a lot going on. Well, I've always enjoyed songwriting. Um, and I just wanted to pursue it. You know, I wanted to, you know, use music as a way to essentially share my ideas, uh, with the world. Cause I, I feel like that's, you know, an effective way to do it. Um, you know, not everybody's willing to, to sit and listen to a two hour podcast, but you know, a lot of people are willing to sit and listen to a two minute song. And I think that, you know, different people hear things in different ways. And so it's just a good way to, to communicate um, with certain people. But, you know, one of my big frustrations is I just feel like in and around people using Bitcoin, the, the general music scene and, and art scene has been okay. I think music or, or there's a lot of really talented artists out there um, that are doing some really cool stuff, but on the music side, less so. Like I think it, I can only really think of like a handful of people that have made anything interesting, um, and none none of them have talked about the importance of cigarettes. Um, 
and living, you know, a truly liberated lifestyle. Um, the cigarettes give you this just like innate ability to actually use your brain. Um, there's something about the nicotine, which is like sparks your brain, um, to work better. And, you know, maybe, I don't know, there's something sacred about tobacco. It's, it's inherently anti-communist at its core, anti-authoritarian. Um, and yeah, I mean, well said, I think I really look forward to, you know, making more music. Um, it's been nice to see it, you know, received well and that people are enjoying it. And, uh, um, I really hope to, you know, find bands someday to, to perform my songs. That's something I've been on, on the lookout for is, uh, credentialed musicians. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing, man. And so Rod, what about you? Um, what got you, uh, um, into the, into music forays, um, a little bit of background there. Uh, I, I gotta be honest, I just, I kind of just have fun with it. I don't think about it too much. I just think that, uh, a song, any content, really podcast, a video, a song is you're, uh, you're basically telling somebody like, I want two minutes, three minutes of your attention and time. Um, so I just don't want to waste people's time. So I don't. I just, I want to make them laugh. So I just want to create something that makes them uh, think about something a little differently and laugh about it that they wouldn't normally, that they wouldn't normally associate with a pop song or um, a hip hop, electro, you know, synth wave song. Mm -hmm. um, so I try to capture their attention and just try to make them think and laugh at lyrics and the rhyme, you know, and just, uh, they're listening for three minutes. I just, Give them something to give them something worthwhile. I don't. I don't have a message or really any theme or any anything I'm trying to put across. I'm really just kind of ref, reflecting culture back to people in a way that uh, maybe they haven't thought about before. Yeah. Yeah. Music and music is a great way to do that for sure. Um, and uh, I will make sure to include links to uh, your music in the show notes as well. Uh, so people can check it out, um, and uh, people can boost, um, you know, on Lightning uh, on Wave Lake too. So, um, yeah, I guess let's take a moment here, because um, yeah, I guess it, it's I found a pretty a pretty easy way to use Lightning, um, which is kind of surprising. But <clears throat> um, I'd like to get your guys' thoughts too. Um, but uh, um, yeah, I, I like uh, the Zeus wallet um, for as as a good Lightning wallet, um, and then. Um, I think it was actually you I asked Richard um, how to uh, tra how to tra uh, I guess uh, I guess uh, swap on chain Bitcoin for Lightning Bitcoin, uh, and there's an exchange called Bolts B O L T Z dot exchange, uh, and uh, you can do that there. And uh, yeah, if you want to try you know toss fifty bucks on or however much, um, and toss it on you know Fountain, uh, you can boost uh, the Bitcoin Bugle, and uh, you can bet you can boost the, uh, the Vani podcast too. And uh, when you're checking out uh, Rod or Richard's music on Wave Lake, you can uh, uh, you can send send them some sets. And uh, all that obviously does uh, does help uh, does help, but um, yeah, I guess you guys want to talk a little bit. Uh, is it, I guess any wallets or anything you want to point out uh, in regards to Lightning or uh, I guess Fountain? No, no, I think this is great. Um, my year, my my overarching kind of opinion or advice on using Bitcoin or Lightning, especially if you're kind of new to using it, every single transaction every single interaction you have is when you add those up that is like your your sovereign model or your security model i if you, you know if you're brand new and you're just trying to figure out how lightning works and you're trying to like send something to a website like if you already have cash up or you already have something just use that get to you know it but as you start to progress find the wallet that uh whatever it is zeus is a great one i, I do recommend that one that suits your your preferences for how sovereign or, or secure you need to be, not just for every day, it's not like one wallet fits all, but just for each type of, of use case, 
it doesn't you don't always have to make it super complicated you can use one of satoshi it's fine it's use one satoshi to buy a, a stick of gum um you know and either zap a song online but if you're doing something else you know zeus wallet might be a much better um use case and it might be worth your time or maybe you've already spent the time to learn about it because it's not super easy to do it's not impossible either but you just can't do it overnight yeah that's true yeah it's a learning yeah, I'm, I'm not convinced anybody can make lightning work really um yeah i mean i think fountain is good I, I i think i think um i think one of the keys that's really important for people to understand is, you know, if we're going to change the way that the incentives work in our society to try and, you know, make things different, um, hopefully for the better, it requires there being a market there, right? Of people willing to do something. And so I'm a big fan of non-compliant transactions in general. And I think people, should strive to do as many non-compliant transactions as possible and to do them adversarially. Um, and that's one of the benefits of like really using Bitcoin. There's been this attitude of, you know, you just need to hodl to make the price go up. But, you know, if there, there isn't a market demand for wallet, wallet developers to exist, like Evan, who makes Zeus, mm -hmm. um, if we're not transacting ad adversarially, you know, these products won't be built um and i, I think non-compliance is really you know one of the keys because you know at the end of the day compliance and asking for permission is just a very like kind of pathetic attitude you know what i mean when you're when you're um acknowledging somebody else's authority when somebody when, when i look at a no smoking sign and i say yeah i guess i'll respect that instead of no fuck you I'm going to smoke right here anyways. Um, because you don't have the right. The newest from Liberty Under Attack publications, the Second Realm Anthology, a collection of short stories that inspire freedom and self-liberation. The First Realm, mainstream society, which does not respect self-ownership or individual liberty, but rather heralds the supremacy of government and authority, upholds the collective over the individual. The Second Realm, a parallel network, founded upon the principles of truth, freedom, and voluntarism, rebuilding all necessary human institutions upon these frameworks. The Second Realm Anthology is a collection of short stories originally published in The Road to Autonomy magazine from a vast selection of authors across a diverse range of topics in the area of freedom, the building of the parallel society known as the Second Realm. The goal is to inspire and educate, to motivate and self-liberate. Authors Todd Borjo, Graham Smith, Jackie Kerouac, Patrick Henry, and Josiah Warren. Order your copy of Second Realm Anthology today by visiting libertyundertack.com slash sranthology. Again, libertyundertack.com slash sranthology. Bitcoin and Monero accepted and preferred. Want to pay with Bitcoin Lightning? Email shane at libertyundertack.com.